Good evening. It is so good to have you all here. We have been waiting for you and preparing for you and for this wonderful evening when we get to uh, spend some time with Richard Rohr. We want to give a welcome to all of you who are in this sanctuary. We want to give a welcome to all who are down in Rada Hall in the overflow room. We, we see you. Uh, we welcome everybody who's with us on Facebook Live. We see you. And uh, those who are going to watch in weeks to come, we're videotaping all of this. So we hope you'll visit our website if you wanted to share the wisdom that we hear tonight with those in your congregations or your circles of friends. Uh, I've been asked to uh, give some words of hospitality. This is our sanctuary, our most holy room, but the second most important room is uh, where the bathrooms are. <laughs> if you need to use the restroom, we invite you to go to the back and out the memorial garden door, and you'll see when you come in the building, the restrooms are there on the right and also down the hall. I've also been asked to remind you to, well, you know what to do with these, right? Uh, if, if you would put it on silence, please do so. Uh, unless you're getting a call to worship, and then by all means, worship. <laughs> I want to thank uh, Peter and Marinda for the music. Thank you. I want to thank the staff of the Chatham United Methodist Church. They have been working behind the scenes for weeks and months to prepare for this evening. I want to thank the volunteers that around here we call disciples, who have been part of the welcome team. If you've seen anyone with one of those uh, welcome badges, uh, they are part of the Ministry of Hospitality in the Chatham United Methodist Church, and they have been preparing for you and are so grateful to, to have you here. Uh, our hope is that tonight can be more than just uh, an event. Our hope is that we can engage the living God. Our hope is that God might be creating a, an ecumenical witness, an ecumenical community, which is the future of Christianity, that is more than just one night. Uh, we're hoping that for those who are interested to come uh, and be a part of a group that processes some of the wisdom of Richard Rohr, that uh, you'll come back to join us on the third Wednesday of each month. You'll see information on the back of this. Uh, we're going to have a Richard Rohr discussion group that will process his daily emails. Richard, what's the count on how many emails you send out a day? I think it's 240,000. 240,000 people. Hmm. That's a good word. That gives me hope that there are 240,000 people out there that really are longing to engage mature Christianity and a spirituality that puts us in the flow of God's love. You'll see the dates on when we'll be gathering here, and there will be an online uh, sign-up if you'd like to come so that we can discern whether to have a meeting in a small room or a larger room. We also want to invite you to come back to uh, a tis a prayer that we have once a month on the second Wednesday of each month. We will not be meeting in the summer, but this church has been nurtured by the spirituality of tis a. We have brought youth and seminarians from Drew University to tis a, and we're hoping to continue to do that because we know that the brothers of tis a have discovered something of the contemplative life that Richard has taught about. In fact, Richard spent some time at tis a uh, two years ago, and, and the brothers were very grateful to have some time of sharing with Richard. We hope you'll come back and feel free to invite your friends to any of that. Uh, most importantly, we are so grateful to have Father Richard Rohr here. Uh, this morning, uh, Georgian Court University bestowed uh, an honorary doctorate on Father Richard, and so tonight is the first time that we get to introduce him as Dr. Richard Rohr. <laughs> I, I know you're not into the titles, but we sure are. We just love this about you. 
Richard has made a difference in my life and in so many of our lives. He has shown us a way forward that is authentic, genuine, grounded in the spiritual life, and always pointing to a deeper truth, a deeper relationship with this mystery that we refer to as the triune God. Um, it is such an honor and joy to, to welcome Father Richard Rohr. Our hope is that we um, are in the flow tonight of God's love. One of the ways that helps us enter that flow is in the ancient tradition of the early church by singing a chant. This particular chant comes from the community of Tizé, France. I invite us to sing this so that the words become more than just words, that they become part of our breathing, part of our heart, part of our spirit. Uh, we'll sing this a number of times, and I will hold the last note and make it very clear that this is the last time through to, to free you up so that you need not fear singing a solo tonight. <laughs> um, and right after that, we are going to have a, uh, a litany of centering prayer with the Trinity that we have been doing in our congregation here at the Chatham United Methodist Church for the last few months where we ring three different bells and just focus our attention on the one who has created us, the one who redeems us, and the one who sustains us. After that time of silence, uh, we will um, be grateful to have Father Richard enter that silence and speak out of that silence, out of that prayerful space that each of us bring into uh, God's presence who is with us, among us, and within us. Let us be in prayer. Oh, Lord. 
We pray in the love of the Trinity who invites us into relationship. We pray and we love with the one who creates. We pray and we love with the one who redeems. We pray and we love with the one who sustains all life, all love, and all of creation. Amen. Good evening. <laughs> it's an honor, and I mean that sincerely. I thank you for your trust. I thank you for the kind invitation. The moment we walked onto your grounds, we received nothing but warmth and smiles. And it makes me uh, so sad about some of my own beginnings. I grew up in Kansas, and um, right across the street was a little Methodist church. I'm talking about 1950, that's how old I am. But, uh, and we didn't have air conditioning in those days, so the windows of the little Methodist church were always open. We would hear the pretty Methodist hymns coming out the window. But I was told, please don't hate us for it, <laughs> never to go in that church. It was a Protestant church. We couldn't even build that big a bridge. Now, you know our wonderful Second Vatican Council happened in between, so it's been 60 years since we thought that way, but it's such a sad memory to come to a place like this filled with so much goodness and so much love. The only Methodist I did get to meet, because I wasn't allowed to go in the church, I don't know if I was going to be struck dead or what, but there was the Methodist home down a block where the older people were taken care of. My mother ran a little beauty shop on the side of our house, and the little blue-haired ladies would come all hour, <laughs> and my mother would make their hair more blue, I think. <laughs> And I remember getting mothered. I was mothered to death. I was my mother's favorite. Uh, even my siblings admit that. And that was a gift, but it was also a curse. But uh, not just having my mother's favoritism, but uh, all these little Methodist blue-haired ladies who, who just fussed over little Dicky. That's what they called me. <laughs> so I, I always saw this is a loving group of people, but it always seemed so sad and so strange to me that we lived in our little tribes. 
Now, if we couldn't build a bridge from Catholic to Methodist, who I've always called the kindest of, of Protestants, uh, uh, even that we have to use those words all seems so useless now, such an utter waste of time. So I hope whatever I'm able to say tonight will invite us into something that's much bigger than that, much more universal, and in all honesty, something that we cannot just agree upon, but must agree upon, it's foundational. As uh, apparently Jeff warned the community, my last book was called The Divine Dance. And I, I thought that was the only thing honestly to talk to you about. I talked about it in Princeton last night. Because if we're going to come to this reform of Christianity, and every one of our denominations needs it. We're all in this together. We really are. We've got to rebuild from the bottom up. And uh, if, if we're going to talk about the bottom and the foundation, the bottom and foundation of the Christian religion is the shape of our God. If you get the shape of God wrong, Everything built on top of it wobbles. <laughs> and that's the wobbling we've been living with for centuries now. Where more and more of our people from all of our churches find us uninteresting, uncompelling after a while. I'm told the second biggest group, it isn't really a group, but we Roman Catholics are still apparently the biggest statistically but the second biggest group is former Roman Catholics. <laughs> people leave our church in droves, and they're not bad people. I keep meeting them. And sometimes they're on, they're on a more spiritual search than those of us who come to the church. <laughs> and it's precisely been their spiritual search which has led them to find what we're saying and what we're doing, frankly, not compelling. And again, these are not unbelievers, these are not atheists, these are not wicked people, they're not bad people, but sometimes more sincere than those of us inside. At least that's my judgment. I hope it's not uh, cruel. But I'm going to dive into it right away with that as a bit of a preference. And I'm going to read, if, I, uh, if you'll allow me to, I, I hate it when speakers read from their books, but I won't stick with it very much. I'll be coming outside of it. This is from page 35 after the William Paul Young's introduction. Did you read The Shack, or did you see the movie The Shack? Yeah. He was with me last month in Albuquerque. We were down at the convention center, and no one in their wildest imagination would have thought you could fill a convention center with a trinity of teachers, William Paul, myself, and Cynthia Bourgeau, the Anglican priest, uh, talking on the trinity. No one would have imagined that. That the trinity could be a subject of actual passion and interest. Karl Rahner said back in 1961, he was the Jesuit, German Jesuit, who was the expert at that, Second Vatican Council, and he said we could drop the doctrine of the Trinity tomorrow, and 98% of Christian practice and belief would remain virtually untouched. And he was talking about all of our denominations. None of us would think of denying the doctrine of the Blessed Trinity, but in terms of pastoral, practical effect, it's had almost none. Of course, all we'd been given was what I call a dualistic mind. And if there's one thing the dualistic mind cannot deal with is something like three. <laughs> uh, and, uh, I don't know how to process that. It was made to order, to uh, force us to a different processor. And I hope whatever I, I might try to say tonight will help you in that same direction. But let me get back to page 35 of the book. In his book, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions, those of you maybe educated in the sciences had to read that book early on in many schools, 
Thomas Kuhn popularized the word that we're all familiar with, paradigm shift, paradigm, some people say. He made clear that even in the scientific field, a paradigm shift is tantamount to what religion calls major conversion. And it is equally rare, he says, in both science and religion. I know it's rare, rare in religion, but I was sad to find out that it's rare in science because we're dealing with the same ego in both fields. And once human beings have wrapped their opinions around what they believe, it takes major conversion to change it. But again, I was shocked that I thought of scientists as people who believe in evidence and logic and reason. But Kuhn makes a convincing case that they aren't any better than we are. And if you read the book, he says toward the end, at least as I remember, it's some years, that for the most part, for a new scientific theory to become widely accepted, the previous generation actually has to die off. <laughs> That's how attached people are to their opinions. That's what happens to Christianity when it no longer teaches the contemplative mind. You see, the dualistic mind is the mind that divides the field of everything into two. Republican, Democrat, if we've seen entry, gay, straight, black, white, Catholic, Protestant. And you think because you chose sides, you're smart. Do you realize how stupid that is? You're presented with two alternatives. This is about the only mind left in Western civilization because the church, Christianity, hasn't been doing its job. Now, I'm lucky, as some of you know, I'm a Franciscan. And I come from a, a tradition that, from the very beginning, was taught the contemplative mind. And it's a different mind. It's a different processing system where you don't divide the field of the moment into what threatens you and what doesn't threaten you what's new and what's old. You leave, by the grace of God, the field open. It is what it is, what it is, what it is, what it is. And I don't have to label it Catholic or Protestant. That, that's no basis for truth. It's no basis for reality. I don't have to label it gay, straight, Black, white. Why is it, brothers and sisters, that things like racism have lasted, and certainly this last year showed us, at the highest levels of Christianity, 2,000 years after the incarnation of God in Christ, and we aren't any better than this. <laughs> that it, very often, Christians reflect the same level of thinking that everybody else does. And then we're not really an alternative society. We're not really an alternative consciousness. But I want to say, and I hope this talk on the Trinity will help us understand, it's not just bad will or evil people. You weren't taught a different processing system to recognize your dualistic mind and to let go of it. Because it frankly is not an avenue to truth. It's just an avenue to being opinionated. <laughs> Do you need much proof after the last 18 months that we live in a country of highly opinionated people? And that is a judgment as much on the right as it is on the left. Right? Don't expect anything new. Don't expect anything good from this level of thinking. It's, as the alcoholics call it, it's stinking thinking. <laughs> And the church wants new better than that. But after, you know, our food fights at the time of the Reformation, 500 years ago exactly, and then followed by the, the high-level rationalism of the Enlightenment of the 17th and 18th century, we all bought into it. We lost our own unique access point, the unique way of knowing that Paul takes for granted. Paul teaches beautifully, especially in 1 Corinthians, 2nd and 3rd chapters. But, you know, if you weren't uh, trained in a religious order in the Catholic Church, and not even all of them, uh, if you didn't go to the Eastern Church where it was held on to much or deeply, most of us in the West 
the word contemplation is a new word. Now, why did they even create such a word as that? Because already by the Desert Father period, third century, let's say, the word prayer, which we all take for granted, had already become so trivialized by misuse. Not doing, not obeying what Jesus told us. Why do you babble on like the pagans do? Don't you know God already knows what you need? You know? That he was clearly talking about some other form of prayer than verbal prayer. In fact, we know that from Luke's gospel. When the disciples of John the Baptist come and say, teach us a prayer like the disciples of John the Baptist. And it seems it's almost a concession this prayer that you and I all love, that we call the Our Father. It's the only known verbal prayer that he ever gave us. Because it isn't the foundational prayer. The foundational prayer is to seek the open field of pure presence and silence. Without the machinations of your brain. That's called contemplation. And at this point in history, especially after the complete overtaking of social media in the last 10 years or so, uh, it's more an alternative consciousness than ever before. Uh, if not for us older folks, if I can call you younger ones that, certainly um, for the millennial generation who seem to be completely addicted to stimulation approximately every two and a half minutes. So isn't that the statistic, Jim, two and a half minutes? Yeah. You've got to look at the phone to keep yourself whirling. <laughs> Not with Trinitarian love, but with diversionary tactics, basically. You know? So we don't know how to fall into that deeper place where the field is wide open. It's all about strengthening your opinions very often because you only listen to your chosen TV channel on the right or on the left. Uh, this isn't uh, making us wiser. Almost the glut of information is making us stupider. Is that a word? I guess it isn't. <laughs> Back to Thomas Kuhn. At the risk of sounding like I'm making a serious overstatement, I think the common Christian image of God, despite Jesus, who came to utterly undo it, there's something symbolic about saying this on the day we call Ascension Thursday where the whole mystery of Christ comes full circle. The one who came forth from God, returns to God, and shows us the treasure map for every human life who follow him on this same path. But in though, even though Jesus presented himself as a part of an intrinsic, inherent relatedness, which reshaped the shape of God, for the most part, and without knowing you personally, I'd be willing to bet that 99% of you in this room, unless you have a contemplative prayer life or have studied the mystics, you probably, your operative image of God is very close to Santa Claus. Um, an old man on a throne, usually white-skinned, white beard too, uh, the Latin word for God is Deus, and if that sounds like Zeus, don't be surprised. It's the same word, <laughs> because it was, it's the same concept, a monarchical God, a lone substance, omnipotent, always omnipotent. I counted the prayers in the Catholic sacramentary. Over half of them begin with Almighty God, Almighty God. You see, if we'd understood Trinity, we would have had to balance out 50% of the prayers if you want to say, Almighty God, that's all right. But let's replace the other 50% with all vulnerable God. St. Bonaventure, our Franciscan mystic who built on St. Francis, he tried to give us living metaphors by which we could picture and understand the shape of God. Because many of us are visual learners, and until you get an image, you can't get it. This God who is relationship itself. And he said, picture a water wheel of three buckets, eternally emptying out, knowing they can empty out, because with absolute certitude, they will be filled up. 
And if a Christian ever tries to define love in any other way than a balancing of self-emptying and infilling, you don't have a Christian definition of love. And most Christians don't. They think it's all about infilling and have had, for the most part, very poor training in self-emptying. You can't self-empty unless you know you'll be filled up again. <laughs> and if we can't rely upon an infinite love, an infinite source, if we can't trust that even our brother and sister Christians will be there to pick us up or fill us up or love us up, who of us is going to empty out? Of course you're not. Huh? So in fact, we, we had a God who was largely operating out of meritocracy. It all depended on merit, worthiness, moral positions. God loved you if you were good. Who of us wasn't directly or indirectly taught that? We were not in touch with an infinite source. We were in touch with a finite source that was always pulling itself back when you weren't good enough, when you weren't pious enough, when you weren't prayerful enough. History has so long operated with an imperial and static image of God, a supreme monarch who is mostly living in splendid isolation from what he, and I use the word he intentionally here, because in this model, God is almost always perceived as masculine. And people are even upset they report me to the bishop when I say she. Isn't that interesting? Why would that upset anybody? <laughs> Unless we get equally upset by the he, but we should know, and if we'd known God as Trinity, we would know God is beyond gender. That's a human concept, huh? Now, Jesus, that's different. But see, we pulled Jesus out of the Trinity, we pushed him onto a throne and made him into God, and so we started calling God he. <laughs> This Trinitarian God is the God who presents himself already in Exodus 3.14 to Moses with a, an anonymous name. You've all been taught it. Huh? I am who I am. I'm not going to risk giving you my name because you're going to think you know who I am. It maintained mystery from the very beginning. So we couldn't, none of us could presume we know who we're talking about when we talk about God. The first centuries had this kind of humility. The reason religion has become so arrogant and so divisive and so exclu exclusionary is because we each think we've got the right definition. We know what arrogance. I, I, I should well be on my knees before I come into a pulpit like this and think I can presume to talk about who God is. But I have to rely upon the tradition, the mystics and the saints and the scriptures, and say, well, they've been charting a course. And the holy ones, the communion of saints, say this is what God looks like. So let's lay that as foundational, that the only language available to religion is metaphor, period, period. And I could defend that before the Pope. Well, this Pope would be no problem. But, but, <laughs> but most Popes, that's the only language possible. It's like, it's like, it's like. Listen to all of Jesus' parables of the kingdom. Everyone begins. The kingdom is like. It's called a simile or a metaphor, an approximation. Never, that's it. You got it. And that started with Exodus 3.14. I will be who I will be. Almost as if playing a game with us. Don't you think you're going to get a hold of me by giving me a name? So, perhaps the very title of the book strikes you as a bit frivolous, The Divine Dance. But any of you uh, educated in Christian theology, you know why I chose that as a title. It took the Christian church three centuries to unpackage the language of John, well, all four of the Gospels, but most especially, it comes to a head, John 14 to 17, where almost nonstop, Jesus talks interchangeably of himself as the Son 
as his father. He came forth from the father. He is the son. He gives us the spirit. The spirit came from the father. You line up all these passages, and I'll just be honest, it sounds like theological gobbledygook. (laughs) I don't know what he's talking about, and I know this is true, at least in Catholic churches. When I'm reading from John's Gospel, the eyes just glaze over. (laughs) They don't know what he's talking about, because they're not Trinitarian for the most part. They would never deny the Trinity. But it wasn't unpackaged. I was raised by wonderful Irish nuns in Kansas, And I remember Sister Ephraim coming in in the third grade. In fact, I think I talk about her here in the book. And they wheeled her in on a wheelchair, sweet old Irish farm lady. And uh, she told us she was going to teach us about the Trinity. And, of course, she holds up the shamrock. (laughs) It's just children, God is like the shamrock. Now, don't think about it. (laughs) Of course, she was absolutely right. This is unthinkable. It's like David Bohm said about quantum physics. The universe is not only stranger than you think, it's stranger than you can think. And I want to say that about the Trinity. It was made to order to undercut the rational mind, the dualistic mind. The Trinity is not only stranger than you think, it's stranger than you can think. But anyway, back to the metaphor. It took him three centuries. Then a group of fathers of the church called the Cappadocian Fathers, Cappadocia is eastern Turkey, they came up with what they thought was the best metaphor for the Trinity. And they took the word from the world of Greek theater Perichoresis. Peri, the word periphery, you know. Choresis, the word choreography, you know. Sure enough, so don't call me a heretic. Don't report me to any bishop. All right. The fathers of the church said God is a circle dance. Hold on to that, all right? Because you're hardly going to get any better 17 centuries later. God is an event of communion. I want you to check out your scriptures tonight when you go back so you know I'm not a heretic. And some Catholics do love the scriptures too, not all of us, but uh, we're trying to rediscover scripture. And I want you to go to Genesis 1, 26, 27. And there it says, let us create in our image. This was always very shocking to our Jewish monotheistic ancestors. Because there, there's no doubting in the oldest manuscripts, there's two plural pronouns used. Let us create in our image. And we know he wasn't talking the English royal we, uh, but clearly it's the first intimation, and I can only call it that, the first intimation of what we're going to eventually recognize that in the beginning is the relationship. And everything that's been created in that image is relational. Now, finally, in the 21st, well, the 20th century, we have the mind to begin to think that way. We couldn't form the metaphors. I see that Jeff put on your little name tags that you have uh, a picture of the atom. You don't have to take it off of your coat jacket, but... You'll notice it's three particles endlessly cycling around one another. The basic building block, although now we've discovered even smaller particles, of the entire material universe. When I first said this about a year ago to a crowd, an um, a atomic physicist we have nuclear labs in New Mexico, he came running up and he said, Richard, it gets better than that. He said, our word for this connection between proton, electron, and neutron, we call it bonding. (laughs) It's an infinite bonding that was never undone until July 16, 1945, right south of where I live. And then Robert Oppenheimer, who was watching, the first time we deconstructed the atom and created the atom bomb, 
he, and he said this came from his deep unconscious. He said this site where it first happened, where we undid the building block of God's creation, it should be called, and if you come to New Mexico, you can visit it, Trinity Site. It's called Trinity Site. He didn't even know why he named it that, but he said it came from some place deep inside of me. You know, when you start connecting to the, what Carl Jung would call the unconscious, maybe we'd call the communion of saints, maybe others would call the, the collective, uh, when you start plugging into that, you, you find out the truth is one, and that all the sciences are coming like the, the three blind men approaching the elephant, coming at it at the scientific level, the theological level, the psychological level, the philosophical level, the sociological level. And we've wasted, I mean wasted, a good hundred years now. These groups calling one another unbelievers or wrong or, or stupid, <laughs> when we're all just blind men touching the elephant and not recognizing if there is one God, and we're the believers in one God, universe means turning around one thing, then you would think that the monotheistic religions would be the first ones to believe that there's got to be one shape to reality, that there's one truth at work, that truth is one. Now, my ability to formulate that truth is very limited, but I'm not going to deny the capacity for absolute truth, or we live in an incoherent universe. And many say this is why we're creating such a high amount of mental and emotionally ill people. You're, the soul was not meant to live in an incoherent universe. You're supposed to have meaning and direction and purpose. And once we see that the shape of God is the shape of everything else, and that everything else you included are cr truly created in the image and likeness of God, and that you have no control over that. It's not your place to decide, well, she has it and he doesn't. Right? Once I give you the freedom, or you think you have the freedom, to decide, well, she is the image of God, but he isn't. Right? <laughs> That's why things like homophobia, racism, sexism, classism have lasted at the highest levels of Christianity. A true seer, a true contemplative would scan this room, image of God, 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 image of God. What tells me you're a Christian is precisely, and I mean this sincerely, your ability to see Christ everywhere else. That's what makes you a Christian. That's the only proof I can find. Huh? You will see Christ's image everywhere. And it's not your place to pick and choose. These black people don't have it. These gay people don't have it. These Protestant people don't have it like I was trained in. What a waste of time. Huh? We've lost too many centuries. The gospel was meant to be a socio-political economic revolution. How else? Is Jesus going to be the savior of the world if we keep him at this tribal level? Keep him just our little Jesus, our little Christ, uh, who just cares about white middle class Americans who vote correctly, you know? Got this God who had nothing to do. You know, everybody was just throwaway. The Stone Age people, the Babylonians, the Mayans. No, don't care about them, don't care about them. Women, children who love their families just as much as you and I. Huh? The Aztecs, the Incas, pagans, pagans. <laughs> Is God really that stingy? Is God really that stupid <laughs> that he was waiting for Roman Catholics to appear? <laughs> <laughs> that he was waiting for evangelicals to make sure the Bible was inerrant? <laughs> You know, that only occurred the last century. We got along 19 centuries without an infallible pope or an inerrant Bible. That's both the 19th century. Now, why did that happen? Because we just came from the 16th, 17th, and 18th century where we were put on the huge defensive. Everybody in Europe was smart. 
They were all rational, educated, laughed at our stupid Christianity, wanted nothing to do with it. So we wanted to appear absolute and rational too. So we created a supposedly rational pope, got us in all kind of trouble, and you created a supposedly inerrant Bible. We got along without either of those for 1900 years. But the earlier centuries had much more patience. I mean, Augustine in the fourth century already says there's at least four levels of interpretation of every text, probably eight. <laughs> we regressed. The literal interpretation, the literal historical, is the least helpful <laughs> and the least inspired. The symbolic, the allegorical, the transformational message is the message, message that changes your soul. And, and that's what our mystics always recognized. But once we didn't have the contemplative mind, we didn't know how to read things symbolically, archetypally, allegorically, spiritually. As Paul says in Corinthians, we didn't know how to read spiritual things in a spiritual way. We read them in a literal, historical way, which is just not that helpful to the soul. Well, uh, I don't have any need to disprove it, but I don't want to limit myself just to the literal, historical level. So back to my book, if you don't mind. Kuhn said that paradigm shifts become necessary when the plausibility structure of the previous paradigm becomes so full of holes and so full of patchwork fixes that a complete overhaul, which once looked utterly threatening, now appears as a lifeline. I think we're at this kind of moment. If the present statistics continue at this rate, by the year 2050, mainline Protestant churches will be empty. I'm just being statistical. <laughs> You're dying, right? Even the lack of youth here tonight is an indication of that. Huh? The way we talk is of no interest to most younger people. And they're not all bad people, not all unbelieving people. I already mentioned to you about the Catholics and the recovering Catholics. Huh? This isn't saying that we're, we're bad people either. But I think our image of God is too small. You know, you're the first generation that has been able to see pictures from the Hubble telescope. And they keep sending them back. And the universe keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And we can now count back. And we say it seems that something happened. We would call it creation. Physicists would call it the Big Bang, 13.6 billion years ago, give a year or two. <laughs> and we can still see that it is moving outward from that original Big Bang. We can prove that. No significant scientist questions that. And not only is it still moving outward from that initial explosion, our creation, and they're not in contradiction, by the way, uh, but they seem, by the latest pictures in the last 20 years, to be accelerating at an ever faster pace. We're moving apart quicker. Now, just to make this very practical, I don't mean to scare anybody, but the day if and when, and I don't know, I'm not a believer or a disbeliever in uh, UFOs. I know I'm from New Mexico where we're supposed to believe in them. But, um, but the day we do discover life on another planet with our present narrative, right, the Christian religion is over. Do you understand? If Jesus just died for a sin that was committed between the Tigris and Euphrates River by a man named Adam and Eve, or a man and woman, huh, we will be laughable. We have to have a God that is at least as big as the universe that the, the next generation takes for granted. Huh? That is, it, we, we, we cannot be a tribal religion anymore. We have to get as big as our God is. And that's what God has a habit of doing, creating people in his own image. And a big God creates big-hearted people and big-sighted people who aren't afraid of the future, who aren't afraid of otherness, who aren't afraid of tomorrow. 
In fact, on this Ascension Thursday, before he leaves them, he tells them not to be afraid. Don't waste time looking up into heaven, you know. But I'm going ahead of you into Galilee. And that's the risen Christ. He's always leading them forward, forward into history. But you would have thought, and Pope Francis has been saying this, you would have thought that the Christian religion, this is his term, was an antiquarian society, the seller of antiques and museum pieces. For some reason, we're in love with the good old days when God was God, you know? <laughs> Give me that old time religion when God was God. Do you see the atheism in that? You see the agnosticism in that? If God isn't present right now in this room, we're in trouble. And if I got to look back to Joshua and Judges and Exodus to find God, then we're all in trouble. We are in great part, and I mean this sincerely, not offensively, I hope, responsible for the phenomenon of Western atheism and agnosticism. Because I've counseled too many people who call themselves atheists and agnostics, and when they describe to me the God they've rejected, you know what I'm going to say? Well, I don't believe in that God either. <laughs> You've rejected a God who doesn't exist. But they're still rejecting this old monarch, white skin, white beard, Zeus, throwing down thunderbolts, liking some people, torturing other people for all eternity. Many people I know and I have counseled had to reject such a God for their own uh, healing from PTSD <laughs> that they got in the first grade when they were told if they weren't God's friend, He would torture them for all eternity. Oh my God. <laughs> this is an unworkable universe. It's, it's an unsafe universe. You can't operate. You, they, those images, and neuroscientists have told me that. You tell a little first, second, third grader such horrifying stories as that, it resides in the brain stem forever, where all fear does, where all abuse does. And I've met people who are PhDs, like I am as of today. <laughs> Whatever that means. <laughs> uh, who, they'll have this massive education and they'll still have an infantile understanding of their Catholic faith. Just it, because it's still in the brain stem, do you understand? And it's mostly fear-based. It has little to do with love of God. It has little, why would you search for a God who's out after you? Who's making a list, checking it twice, going to find out who's naughty or nice? If your basic image of God is negative, now, you Methodists are lucky. I know we're not all Methodists here, but your Wesley, I think, was a little mystic. But not all of our Reformed traditions had that same grace. Some, sorry, spoke of human nature as being totally depraved. That is a pit so deep. <laughs> it's so far from what I was taught as a Franciscan. You know, Genesis says it five times in a row. It was good. It was good. It was good. First chapter of Genesis, it was good. It was very good. We begin with original innocence. But you know what? And this is almost perverse. We jump to chapter 3 and decided to begin with original sin, a word that isn't even in the Bible. We began with the problem and made Jesus into a mere problem solver, do you see? We ignored Genesis 1. It is good, it is good, it is good, it is good, it is very good. Read it when you go home. I didn't make that up. And we have to rebuild Christianity on a Trinitarian notion of God, which I'm still going to try to describe, but a positive anthropology of the human person. No offense to my Lutheran brothers and sisters, because whenever I see... Luther movies, honestly, I identify with Luther much more than the Pope because he was a true reformer. But like, you know, what did Carl Jung say? Uh, the greater light you have, the greater shadow you cast. Um, Luther says that the human person is a pile of manure covered by the snow of Christ. He's not doing us any favor. Do you understand? <laughs> you can't 
a, a positive theology can't undo a negative anthropology. <laughs> when you've already dug a hole and put people in it, and how terrible they are, fire and brimstone sermons, to convince you that you needed my salvation. So it's called learned helplessness. Make sure the whole congregation feels sinful, shameful, and helpful, helpless, and I'll come along as the divine Savior and say, well, I'm a priest. I can forgive sins, you know? That's called job security, all right? <laughs> It's called codependency. It's not going to save the world because it gathers people to that lower brain stem level of reaction. Not people in love with God, not people in love with the world, the future, the planet, but basically people, and I'm just, I think, being honest, people who are largely motivated by fear. The lowest level of human motivation for anything. And we were allowed to get away with that for so long that a lot of us took it for granted. That we were supposed to be afraid of God. You, you've certainly been told this by Jeff and many of your preachers. The most common one-liner in the Bible is do not be afraid. Now, I've never counted it myself. But some say it actually is 365. It's at least close to 365. One for every day of the year. And yet most of us were encouraged to be afraid of God, afraid of the church, afraid of the last judgment, afraid of hell, afraid, afraid, afraid. We appealed not to love, the highest level of motivation. And you know what happens when you do that? You create a whole congregation that operates at that level of motivation. And again, the events of the last 18 months are making this painfully apparent to most Christian congregations, that we were not an alternative to the rest of society, on left or right. I'm not taking sides. But how about instead of God being an eternal threatener, how about having God as the ultimate participant? Not eternal threatener, but ultimate participant. I'm going to try to describe the two paradigms in, strict, in stark contrast. Instead of an omnipotent monarch, let's try what God as Trinity demonstrates as the actual and wondrous shape of the divine reality. Instead of God watching life happen from afar on his throne and judging it, did you see Trump in the Sistine Chapel? He liked that. You know, it's all dualistic. Did you ever see the Christ? I know it's great art, Michelangelo's art, but it's totally dualistic. Uh -huh. God raising his hand, inviting one half of the crowd in and damning the other half of the church. Dualistic thinking in art. Uh -huh. Did you, I want you to see orthodox icons of what they call the harrowing of hell or apocatastasis or anastasis. You'll see the Christ with legs spread over the, the dark pit of hell. Chains are flying in all directions, and Jesus is pulling everybody out of hell. Hmm? See, that's high-level consciousness. It was called the harrowing of hell. And if you think I'm saying something new and dangerous, read our conservative Pope Benedict. Read his commentary on the Apostles' Creed. I don't know if you use the Apostles' Creed in your church, but somewhere uh, toward the middle, it says, and he descended into hell. I remember asking Sister Ephraim, Sister, why did Jesus go to hell? And, <laughs> and she said, to get Noah and Abraham. LAUGHTER of course, well, my little third grade, okay, sisters can't be wrong, but what are Noah and Abraham doing in hell? Of course, of course, this isn't the Dante notion of hell at all. This is Hades, Sheol, the place of the dead. That later place of torture all got added on, more by Dante than the scriptures. But at any rate, back to the Apostles' Creed, and this is from a conservative pope, so you can't call me a heretic, all right? He says, well, I'll tell you what it means. If Christ visited hell, then hell doesn't exist. Because <laughs> Christ and hell cannot coexist. Christ is the undoing of all death. Hmm? 
There is no hell. And then John Paul II says the same thing. Uh, you can check it out. His general audience, June 28th, 1999. <laughs> he said to a group of huge conservative Catholics, when will Catholics realize that heaven and hell are not geographical places, they are states of consciousness. <laughs> From a pope, if that impresses you Catholics, all right? They're states of consciousness. And there's probably, I hope not, there's probably people in hell in this room right now for good reasons and for stupid reasons. Huh? But hell is a, a self-chosen state that almost always proceeds from dualistic thinking. So instead of this God watching life from afar and judging it like he appears to be doing in the Sistine Chapel, how about God being inherent in life itself? What else could it be? Come on, be honest. What else could God be? How about God being the life force of everything? If Trinity is true, if this water wheel of infinite love, if in the beginning is the relationship, here, here's a language that maybe a lot of you will, will understand. God is much more a verb than a noun. <laughs> That's what we're saying. God is much more a verb than a noun. God is much more an action, a presence, a connection, a communion that connects you to everything and keeps you in love with everything. When you're not in love with everything, you're not in God. There it is. <laughs> That's hell. And God is the supreme connector. And you see it in holy people. They have no trouble loving the outsider, the supposed enemy. They're resistant to creating enemies, even in their minds, because God has done God's connective force through them and in them and with them. Another uh, man came to me after I gave this talk in New Mexico a few weeks ago or something similar to it, and he came up and he said, Richard, do you know I'm an electrician? And he said, do you know electricity cannot work by a flow in one direction? It has to be in a circuit. I said, really? Why didn't someone tell me that? <laughs> the whole physical universe, you, you, you leave here and go home. The whole uni physical universe is relationship, is circuits and flows and cycles and orbits and circulatory systems and photosynthesis and nothing exists separate. And that's what quantum physics has, has recognized that all quanta will die immediately if you separate them. They have to be cycling around something else. There is nothing in the universe that is not in an ecosystem of connection. And the galaxies know that, the atom knows that, and everything in between knows that. You want to know who doesn't know it? Human beings. <laughs> we try to be separate and superior. That's the way the human ego works. That's what the ego wants more than anything else, to be separate and to be superior. Once you let go of those two games, you'll, you'll find this communion, this connection, this underlying flow much more evident and obvious and everywhere. The belief in God isn't a huge leap anymore. It isn't an impossibility. It isn't believing six impossible things before breakfast, like C.S. Lewis said Christianity had become. But it in fact, is your deepest intuition about the nature of yourself, your own soul, your own body, and your own family. How about God being the life energy between each and every object? Now, here again. Atomic physics helps us. Do you know the real energy in the atom is not the neutron, the proton, or the electron, but the relationship between them? The energy is in the relationship, and we can't capture that. We can't measure that. We're trying to control it, but it, it's like spirit. It's invisible. It's, it's not anything. Now, John of the Cross, Teresa of Avila, our great Catholic mystics, said you cannot know God the way you know any other object of attention. Every other object of attention, you give it your attention. You as a subject, objectify it, pay attention to it, describe it, 
try to understand it. Uh, and that maintains what the Zen Buddhists would call the subject-object split. I'm the subject over here, that's an object over there, and I know it by analyzing it. I know it by uh, seeing it in a discriminate way. Now, can you imagine there's another way of knowing? To not split into subject and object, but to know things subject to subject. That's contemplation. You can only know God in loving God. Pseudo Dionysius, fifth century. Bonaventure, Francis. Why did Francis call everything brother sun, sister moon, sister fox, brother air, sister fire? It was a subjectivized, enchanted universe. It all lived inside of this one divine flow. But he's the first recorded person, and that was the 13th century, the first recorded person to grant subjectivity to the natural world. Now, if you think I'm going into dangerous territory, now I'll appeal to the Catholics again. You know, we Catholics are those strange people who believe that Jesus is really present in bread and wine. I know all of our churches have different opinions on that different explanations of that. I'm going to be very Catholic. <laughs> of course, of course. It's just taken this whole mystery of incarnation to its logical conclusion. Once you see the flow, you see it everywhere. I know when I celebrate Mass very often, I say to the crowd, it's easier to convince bread of what it is than it is to convince you. <laughs> St. Augustine said that in the fourth century. Keep feeding the body of Christ to the body of Christ till the body of Christ knows it's the body of Christ. You are what you eat. And Flannery O'Connor, I was just corrected on that the other day. I was giving this credit to Dorothy Day. But someone came up to me, those smart people in Princeton, and said, <laughs> said Flannery O'Connor said it. She said, if the bread and wine thing is just a symbol, to hell with it. To hell with it. It's just a symbol. We don't need symbols. We need reality. <laughs> Either God is invested and incarnate in the physical world, or we're living in an unsacred universe, which is why we can pollute the planet the way we do, which is why we can do what we've done to this one and only earth that we have, because it wasn't sacred. It isn't sacred. And it isn't up to you to decide what human beings are sacred or whether the earth is sacred, all right? It, it really is an all-or-nothing proposition. Either this whole thing came forth from God or it didn't. Either God created all things or God created nothing. And that would even be a strong philosophical position if you're going to believe in one God. Who else created the Mayans? Who else created the Incas? Who else created the Babylonians? We, were, we say one God created all things. We were raised in my generation on a horrible little document called the Baltimore Catechism. And I've got to say it here. <laughs> It was written by a Monsignor from New Jersey <laughs> and imposed on generations of Catholics, not high-level theology at all. But if you still have, I still have my dog-eared copy of the Baltimore Catechism, right? It was question and answer. Some of your churches had, the Lutherans had catechisms, I know. Um, and I want you to open up to question 16. Question 16 now, now when, the way I was raised in the 50s, uh, we had to memorize the answers. And you, ha and you were tested on it constantly. And sister would give the question, and the whole class would come back. And she would say, question 16, where is God? And then she would put out her hands, and we'd all say together, I'm going to find out who are the true Catholics in this room. <laughs> Here is the question, where is God? Very good. <laughs> Question 16. God is everywhere. Well, then almost the entire rest of the Baltimore Catechism says, 
well, we didn't really mean that. <laughs> God's really only in the Catholic Church. <laughs> And really only in the tabernacle, which we have up here, you know? And only the priest has the key to the tabernacle. Do you see much symbolism there? Huh? We're in control of God. Oh, the, the pretensions of the human ego. To think we can capture God, we can control God, we can dole out God. But don't think I backtracked on real presence. I believe in real presence, I think, more than most Catholics do who seem to come to communion in a rather haphazard way. And you really wonder. But they haven't been taught how to be present to the presence, so they don't know how. It's not their fault. They weren't taught contemplation. See, the other way of knowing than analysis is to know something by being present to it. That's it. Don Scotus, Bonaventure said that in the 13th century. Huh? It's a different way of knowing it. It's knowing it by respecting it. Respect comes from the French to look at something the second time. The first look, the first gaze is functional, exploitative, pragmatic. Is she good looking? Can I make any money from it? That can't get you very far. But to look at something with respect, to take a new pair of glasses and look at it with love, and see it in its wholeness, that's basically what it is to be a mystic. You see everything in its wholeness, not in its parts. You hold it together in its wholeness and don't allow it to be divided or to be split. Then you can find a reason to love just about everything once you see it in its wholeness. I can't give you a better promise of a happy life. If you want to be happy, if you want to be never lonely again, be a contemplative, because the world is enchanted. You can pray all the time. You can find God everywhere. I love these lovely churches that we have, but we, you know, you really can pray out there just as much as in here. In fact, if you're not praying out there, I doubt if you'll learn how when you come in here. It's all or nothing. Either God is everywhere or God ends up being nowhere. So how about God being the life energy between, allowing everything to be respected, subject to subject, brother, sister? I told this last night, and it comes to mind because she's so much on my mind. I, I put my 15-year-old black lab down uh, about five weeks ago, and I... I'm still not over it, and only those of you who have a dog can understand, but this black lab mirrored me hour by hour for 15 years with perfect, unconditional love. And when that mirror is withdrawn, I, just, I still feel a certain kind of emptiness. And you must say, what kind of pagan is he? Well, <laughs> I still have the divine presence, but I don't have this mirroring that she gave me. So if I'm going to talk about real presence... I didn't learn real presence from going to a seminary and studying the definition that we Catholics have of the real presence of Jesus in the bread and the wine. I mean this with all sincerity. I learned real presence from my dog. <laughs> she was absolutely and always present to me. Now, only now do I realize the last month when she kept sustaining this this gaze at me, you know, and they're telling you it's their time to go. And I wondered, why is she looking at me so much? And I guess she knew I wasn't ready to let go of her. But she was clearly ready, and when I had to put her to sleep, she put her two beautiful black paws down. I'm sobbing, of course, looking straight at her. And she looks at me, and like a Muslim bowing to the floor, she just bows her head, and dies. I said, God, I hope I can die with that kind of freedom, with that kind of acceptance, with that, that kind of surrender. It's not just we human beings that God loves. And if you think, again, I'm a heretic, a father of the church who's called the father of orthodoxy, Saint Athanasius, third century, honored in both the Eastern Church and the Western Church, as the father of orthodoxy, he says the word became flesh 
means God took on the material universe. It wasn't just confined to the body of Jesus. That's why it doesn't say, say the Logos became Jesus. It says the Logos became materiality, John 1.14. So the whole universe was sanctified by the Incarnation. And ever since the moment of the Big Bang, matter and spirit have cohered. Matter is the revelation place of spirit. Spirit is the place that hides and yet reveals itself through matter. Now that became personified 2,000 years ago. And I'm not backtracking on Jesus in the least. But I think only around 2,000 years ago was the human psyche ready for an I-thou relationship for what was true everywhere, to see and to accept and to love in one human being who our eyes could see, as John's letter says, our hands could touch. We were ready for an I-thou love relationship, which we call Jesus. But we then only confined it to Jesus and then felt our job was to prove that he was the unique and only Son of God. <sighs> That's what dualistic mind does. It always chooses sides. So we prove Jesus was God, but his whole plan was to put humanity and divinity together. And you know what he said, 17 times, follow me. <laughs> he never once said, worship me. You find where he ever said to worship him. He said, follow me. Or as in John's gospel, he says, what I have done you also must do. What he put together, you must put together. That you also are sons of earth and sons of heaven, are daughters of this world and daughters of eternity. That's the whole point. That's the meaning of salvation. That's why we were supposed to be good news for the world, to t give people back their inherent dignity. I read a sociological study on why Paul in such a short time, basically a decade, the 50s, is credited as having evangelized Asia Minor and much of Greece. How could this be possible? Hmm? And the, the sociological analysis is, oh, we all believe he was being guided and helped by the Holy Spirit, but into the midst of a debauched society, where women were treated like chattel, where three out of five people were enslaved, where nobody had human rights. You could treat anybody any way and get away with it. Huh? For a man to come into the plaza and say, you all are the temple of God. To restore human dignity to a humanity without dignity. If we don't do that, I don't see any future to Christianity. If we just keep proclaiming some God off in the heavens, and it, 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 they say human beings aren't interested in something if it doesn't include them. <laughs> and I think it's probably true. Maybe it's our own form of narcissism. But you can't just keep worshiping something that has nothing to do with you. And that's the way the millennials tell me, it doesn't interest me. It has nothing to do with me. And that's the God we've allowed them to think they believe in. The implications of this spiritual paradigm shift, this Trinitarian revolution, are staggering. Every vital impulse, every force toward the future, every creative momentum, every loving surge, every new springtime, which you're enjoying in your beautiful green state, every dash toward beauty, every running toward truth, every ecstasy before simple goodness, every leap of Elan Vital, every bit of ambition for humanity. And I'm gonna be honest, I often find it more in research scientists, doctors and nurses than I do in people who come to church. And I'm just picking on Catholics. They come late and leave early because it's so boring, apparently. <laughs> apparently that's all I can conclude. Uh, and then I go and, and go to a hospital and I'm treated with eye contact and caring and touch and interest and follow up and follow through. I meet caring people who are in the flow. Now I'm sure there's bad doctors and nurses too. 
But it's not hard for me to tell who a Christian is anymore. And it has little to do with the label. You can tell, and every one of you in this room can tell people who are in the flow and people who've stopped the flow. Usually within the first five minutes. Some people just have a, a cold wall in front of them. They don't know it. They don't mean to. No one told them what heaven and hell really were. So they live in hell. This is nothing, brothers and sisters, that, uh, that you have to agree with or believe in. You're already in the flow. <laughs> yeah. <coughs> don't trust me. Just trust yourself. Trust the life force that you already are. <coughs> Excuse me. In the chirp of every bird, excited about a new morning, in the hard beauty of every sandstone cliff, we have a lot of them in New Mexico. They're so majestic and beautiful sometimes that I, I don't know what I'm thinking, but it's awesome. You know that word that is translated fear of God? The, the correct translation is awe, not fear, <laughs> not craven fear. To stand in wonder and awe. If you can't stand in wonder and awe before the flowers that, are, that I've seen just today in New Jersey, you, you don't know how to respect the universe. <laughs> if every morning doesn't get you excited, I don't see how you're a Christian. What good are you? <laughs> what good are you for the universe? We've got to rebuild from nature all the way up. And as Bill Plotkin told our school a few years ago in Albuquerque, he believes the missing link in Western spirituality is nature. That we, we just encrusted ourselves inside of books, 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 words, ideas, and the Word had become flesh. And we avoided the flesh, the material world, and we preferred books. The Word became flesh, and we returned it back into Word, as it were. In the deep satisfaction of every job well done, in the passion of sex, yes, I just said that, and he, even in a clerk's gratuitous smile, I mean, sometimes I want to leap across the counter at these gratuitous people checking me out at the, gra at the grocery store. She didn't need to smile, but he did. Whenever it's gratuitous, Whenever it isn't expecting anything back, it's just given for free. That's God. God is, can be identified by gratuity. I promise you that. Whenever anything is gratuitous and free and makes you more free, you have just experienced God. In the passivity of the hospital bed, the world, life, death, the present or the future, I'm now quoting 1 Corinthians. All belong to you, and you belong to Christ, and Christ belongs to God. That is in the Scriptures. He doesn't say some belong to Christ. And then in Colossians, he goes even further. You can check it out, Colossians 3, 4, and Colossians 3, 11. There is only Christ. He is everything and he is in everything. Go home, read it. I didn't make that up. That's not. <laughs> when Christ is fully revealed, and he is your life, you too will be revealed in all your glory with him. All I ask, brothers and sisters, because I have to draw this to a close, is I'm not asking you to believe anything I just said because I said it. Who am I? I'm going to be out of your life in a few minutes. Huh? But don't throw it out until you've tried it. <laughs> until you've tasted and seen the goodness of the Lord. It's not a moral matter. It's a mystical matter. Right? It's a matter of keeping the heart space open, the head space open, and the body open to what's right in front of you. And allowing it to change you. <laughs> That's what vulnerability means. But when God wasn't seen as vulnerable, we didn't have to be vulnerable either. You see, you become the God you worship. And when God is exclusively defined as almighty, that's why we have the power struggles in our politics and our politicians. 
All they're seeking is power, power, power. They know nothing about vulnerability, nothing about self-emptying, because they were given half a definition of God, and we become the God we worship. If God is almighty, it's almighty all the way down. Do you understand? If God is an eternal torturer, then torture is legitimated all the way down. If God is into excluding his enemies, then we have every right to get Mexicans and Arabs out of our country. But if God is the incarnate one who has taken spirit and hid it inside of flesh and hid it inside of everything material that your eyes have ever seen, it's a different universe. And it's a different politics and it's a completely different spirituality. But this Christianity can't can't waste any time on excluding. <laughs> There's nothing to exclude. <laughs> Who are the unworthy ones? You, me, all of us together, of course. <laughs> and it's not for us to decide who carries the divine image because the divine image is everywhere. And you are that image. So don't disbelieve it till you begin to try it. And then the truth will speak for itself by your own happiness, by your own joy, by your own compassion, by your own increased capacity to love your neighbor as yourself. When you see that, when you can see Christ in everybody else, you have finally yourself become a Christian. Thank you. Thank you. Friends, Father Richard is going to spend about 15 or 20 minutes. We'll have some question and answer. If you need to leave, we understand. Um, if uh, on your way out you would like to um, put your name and email on one of the clipboards by the registration tables, that will keep us connected for future opportunities to be an ecumenical expression of being in the flow. The offering plates are also at the registration tables. All of the proceeds from tonight's event will go to support Father Richard's work in Albuquerque at the Center for Action and Contemplation and throughout the world. If you have a question, just raise your hand and I will bring the mic to you. Yes. Let's keep it brief so we can have as many questions as possible. Father Richard, uh, do we have ego or does ego have us? Say, say it again. Do we have ego, or does ego have us? Oh, oh, I see. Well, I think you could say both are true. Uh, we do, and remember, the word ego is not in, in a bad word. You have to have an ego to let go of your ego. I couldn't have the self-confidence to stand up here and talk the way I talked if I didn't have an ego. So you don't want to say it's bad. But uh, it does have us, for sure, in terms of this search for separateness and superiority. But having an appropriate sense of self, self-love, self-boundaries, self-confidence, I hope every one of you in this room has that. And that's what I mean by a positive anthropology, forgive the big word. So a positive anthropology, big uh, builds on a good sense of ego. Okay, an appropriate sense of ego. Good boundaries. Hi. Um, I would love for you to speak on the idea of being loving towards everyone, um, seeing Christ in everyone and in everything, and when circumstances happen that there are people that aren't healthy for us um, or that cause abuse or stress in our lives, um, how to be in a place of loving and also being in a place of self-preservation. Well, let's go back to our definition of love. If the Trinity is the shape of reality, and God is a perfect balancing of self-emptying and infilling, then we have to learn to love in the same way. 
uh, balancing the outflow with the inflow, just like the electrical circuit. Now, it takes much of our life to learn that balance. We've learned so much about codependency in the last years, how a lot of people felt, felt they had to do all the giving or no one would love them. And that created a, its own set of problems. So I think the main thing that we have to be freed from, and it's just my opinion, but is our judgmental mind that labels and categorizes things as worthy of love and not worthy of love. That's the dualistic mind that we have to be freed from. That's the primary task of any contemplative practice, where you practice, and it, basically you have to rewire this, and it takes years, that you notice your negative response toward this lesbian woman. And then you, you have to catch yourself doing that. Say, well, where did that come from? Huh? This is not love. Huh? And you have to suffer that humiliation of how petty you are, how self-protected you are, how prejudicial you are, whatever it might be. So you learn, and this might seem surprising to you, you learn the three steps forward, how to cooperate with grace by actually falling in to the two steps backward. <laughs> That's the divine dance of movement. It's never a straight line forward. You have to fail, <laughs> but you have to see that you failed. Now, the medieval saints call that weeping over your sins. Like, I'm, like I said, I'm in my 75th year, and you'd think I'd be holy by now, but I still see myself with inner petty responses, and, and I just want to cry sometimes, you know? I don't shame myself anymore like I did when I was young. I don't uh, carry the guilt, but I still take the responsibility for it. Richard, that was a really petty thought. You're not in the flow. So now I, I've developed a tuning fork much stronger than when I was young that I can tell when I'm in the flow and when I'm blocking the flow. And it's all about love. It really is. <laughs> That's all you will be judged on in the evening of life, as John of the Cross says. But what makes it hard to love some people, and of course some people are hard to love. We all know that. But it's increased by your, your judgmentalism toward them that you think it is your job to change them now. Neither of those might or might not be true, that it's your job to change them now. Our only obligation is to change ourselves. Uh, yeah, always, 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 always. First, whatever's happening is a call for me to grow up a little more, to mature my response. Now, once I'm sure I can do that, I might have to have a, you know, a civil conversation with my husband or my children or my wife, whatever it might be, but not until, not until you can get to yes. People often ask me, how long should I pray? They say you need to pray as long as it takes to get to a foundational yes. There are mornings where it takes me a half an hour because I wake up negative already, cynical, uh, uh, judging people in my mind. Once you can get to yes, then you can make later proper, appropriate no's but it doesn't come out of negativity, doesn't come out of resentment, doesn't come out of fear. Who's next? Way in back, huh? My teacher. Oh, thank you. I'm sorry that I might talk about myself for more than one sentence, but I'm looking for your guidance. I had a nature-based vision upon conception of my first child, <clears throat> and that's what it, I just want to know what it means for not only me, but the bigger picture. If it's one thing I've learned from you, it's things have more than one meaning. So you had a, a vision, did you say, yes. of your birth child? No, no it was a nature-based, uh, in the form of animals. Oh. Uh, and what was it you saw? I believe, um, if you would like me to speak about it, it might take a little while, but... Um, uh, I believe a fox was the first image, but it was confusing because it also looked like a, a hare, a hare. Um, also, um, a rabbit with its young, and a, a rodent like a, a mice with its young, and also um, a. <laughs> I'm so I'm sorry that this is taking long, but um, yes, I'm just looking, since I don't know any shaman off the top of my head, 
where I should go for, from here. Sure. Uh, it's amazing how much in Christian history, in the lives of our saints, and certainly the earlier ones, even more so, the Celtic ones who were much more nature-based and body-based, uh, that the, the straight gaze from an animal is very often an extremely safe place to enter in to the transcendent. Because from human eyes, we feel judgment. We feel exclusion, criticism. They're evaluating me. We all know now in, in many therapy, not just therapy dogs, but therapy horses, that a lot of people who have been severely abused or hurt feel totally safe in the presence of an animal. Now, I'm not saying that animal is God, but I'm saying it's a doorway to their own soul. And we need these doorways. We need these windows to trust the deeper world. And many people do find that through an encounter with an animal. And that's not paganism. I think it's full incarnationalism <laughs> that God is revealed in and through all things, the physical world and the animal world and the elemental world, as we see in bread and wine. Thank you for being here. Chatham and Princeton are relatively middle class communities. Do you feel like this, this vision that you're sort of proposing is something easily accessible within marginalized or poor communities? Is it something those folks sort of intuitively know? Or is it something we in the middle class sort of have to learn? You know, uh, I am of the belief that we intuitively know this. And I say that because of my observation of children before the age of five. Uh, there is a kind of mirroring that many of you have experienced from your own babies and your own children. There's a readiness to understand uh, an invisible, transcendent depth of meaning in things. Now, I admit, it's pre-rational consciousness, but it lays the foundation for trans-rational later in life. I can't tell you over the years in spiritually directing different people, how, and maybe it's after a deep trust relationship has been formed, but they will talk often in a hushed voice. Their, their voice goes lower, pianissimo, and they talk about experiences of the holy that they had as a little four-year-old, five-year-old, even six or seven-year-old child. It's common. And they'll often choke up and say, I never told this to anybody. Because you see, it was a pre-rational experience. Once they've moved through the rational stage, which we all do, we get embarrassed by such things. But I think the early pre-rational, intuitive, unitive consciousness of children and probably why Jesus, when the disciples were getting into their head, would put a child in front of him, is the preparation. I remember I was raised in Kansas, and going out on my cousin's farms in the summer, I had a little spot of velvety green grass out behind the corn stalks where no one could see me. And I know, I mean, that's probably the reason I became a priest. I know I experienced God there, just laying on that grass, looking up at the Kansas sky. And you know, Kansas isn't real exciting. But, <laughs> but, but once, once you see the mystery of things, the depth of things, which the child uh, is capable of, now he's probably about seven or eight then, so I was beginning to move into the rational mind, but it, it, it anchored me. There is more than meets the eye. There is presence here. There is reality here. And so the idea of becoming a priest or a Franciscan just made a lot of sense because I always felt like I was in on a secret. You know, I bet no people, everybody else doesn't know what I know. But I know I'm speaking for at least half of you in this room. You, many of you had such moments, but there was no one there to validate it, to talk about it, and so it largely gets lost in the hormones of the teenage years. <laughs> it all appears unreal. So I hope that's some kind of answer. Thank you. 
Um, you talked about how God is most accessible through, or only accessible through analogy and metaphor and yes. so on. But you also believe No, that not accessible. D d can only be described by metaphor. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You also ahead. believe strongly that God can be described or is accessed through the real presence in the Eucharist. Could you talk a little bit more about how we reach God through that sacrament? Well, uh, I, I hope I said, I tried to say, that there's the analytical way of knowing reality by cognition, where this thing works up here, well, I dissect it and I understand it in its parts. The, the other way of knowing is precisely by turning off that cognitive function, the Desert Fathers called it the shedding of thoughts. The shedding of thoughts. Pure presence. And uh, to know something by pure presence, not uh, cogitating about it, but simply being present to it. And I promise you something. When you can do that to something however simple, I've often do done it with lizards in New Mexico, uh, you fall in love with it. Whenever you can be simply present to a thing in its gratuity, in its beauty, in its non-necessity. Why this? Why? Am I the only human being ever to look at this lizard? Why did God create it? It's enough to convert you. You know, Teresa of Avila says this at the end of life. She says, once you get it, even a sardine can convert you. <laughs> Once you see the presence, once you intuit the communion, the connection, you intuit it everywhere. So the bread and the wine for us in the churches is just the focus point. Get it here, struggle with it here, fight it here, resist it here, surrender to it here, and then you'll see it everywhere else too. But the downside of our Catholic over-idolization of the bread and the wine was we stopped with the bread and the wine. You understand? Like I'm in a lovely, poor Mexican-American parish in Albuquerque, and these dear people, it's so easy to preach to them. They just eat it all up. I hope that's some kind of answer. Um, but they will receive communion, and then, you know, we Catholics have the golden tabernacle. Oh, you have it on a side altar. And then they'll genuflect to the, altar, to the tabernacle. And I'll say, don't you realize you just became the tabernacle? You missed the point. <laughs> You're the moving vehicle that holds the body of Christ. You're the new Ark of the Covenant, but you didn't get the point. You're still bowing and scraping before God out there, God over there. That's what creates atheism. As long as God is out there, over there, uh, human beings are not interested in anything that doesn't include them. So I hope that's some kind of answer. I, presence is a way of knowing. I talk about this mostly in my book, The Naked Now. Also, Immortal Diamond. A yeah. couple more, I guess. Um, I just want to return to something that uh, has already been mentioned, but maybe to be a little bit more directive with it. Sure. How do I love the person that has abused me? How do I love the person that has intentionally hurt me? I don't know how to do that. I'm working, trying to work with the framework from the proposition and believing in it. Sure. But I'm having that challenge. And I dare say probably many sure, of us. Sure, we all do. You're speaking of a universal you. problem. You know, Meister Eckhart says, God always and only loves God's Son in me. If you are the body of Christ, uh, and God cannot not love God's Son in you. The, I, I don't know, are you familiar with Merton's distinction between the true self and the false self? What we have a hard time loving, and you probably should, is people's false self. You see? But once you can learn what I was saying, image of God, image of God, image of God, to look beyond, yeah, he's an abuser and he has to be stopped. I'm not condoning the behavior by any means. But um, I can still love God's image in him. That's the true self, hidden with Christ in God. 
I love to tell a story and it comes to mind now. I was on a commission for the Franciscans in Rome for three years and I have to go over to meetings in Rome and I'd always take a little side trip up to Assisi. And I was sitting next to this older Franciscan. We sat in seniority at these long, big refectory tables. <clears throat> and we got to know one another and uh, got pretty friendly. And he said to me one day, he said, Richard, you're going to know the day I die. I said, really? He said, let me tell you why. And you can find some of these pictures on internet if you want to. He said, uh, in 1945, I think it was 45, when we Italians killed Mussolini and strung him up in the square in Milan, he said the crowds, and th I've seen camera pictures of this, are just battering his body and the blood is flowing down and his girlfriends and everybody's being beaten. He said, I and two other friars in our brown robes came into the square, and we knew we, we had to, to use the authority. The Italians wouldn't hit a priest, at least in 1945 they wouldn't. I think they probably would now. But um, we walked into the middle, we said, basta, he is still the image of God. He is still the image of God. And we cut him down, and the three of us on our shoulders carried the bleeding body of Benito Mussolini out of the square and buried it in a secret place. And the cops came to us quickly saying, where is he, where is he? They said, we're not going to tell you. And they said, okay, they finally agreed. When all three of you are dead, we will release it to the press where he is buried, so they wouldn't get in any kind of legal trouble. I guess my friend is still alive, because we still don't know. <laughs> I do know the other two friars have since died. But uh, I, I tell this story because it makes the point so well. Even Benito Mussolini, even Adolf Hitler, objectively, I'm not saying subjectively, objectively carried the divine image. You see, it, it, we got to stretch it that far. That's why I say it's all or nothing. Now, that doesn't mean we tolerate the behavior of a Mussolini or a, or a Hitler, but we, it is not ours to disrespect the body of Christ in any of its forms. And everything is the body of Christ. Hello. Um, I wanted to ask you about a lot of the discussion, the, the talk this evening, a lot of these ideas um, are very similar to Buddhist uh, beliefs, systems, you know, the dualistic. Truth is one. Yes. <laughs> and I grew up Catholic, um, but I would say, you know, of the last 10 years or so, I've, I think I've, I've found Buddhism and discovered this kind of dualistic and finding presence and contemplation and I feel that the, the, the Buddhist, um, the, the philosophy gives you a lot of tools that m help you find a, a presence and a contemplative mind. For Christians, um, what, where, and I'm wondering if, first of all, that's why Buddhism is all of a sudden becoming very popular in the West, if other people like myself are finding these truths through that. But if you're of the Christian faith, where can Christians find those same tools within the Christian text to help them relieve their suffering and their yeah. hell and all of that? Sure. That's much of the curriculum of our living school, to retrieve the Christian contemplative tradition, which we have just as strongly. But that's why I gave you that bit of history about the Reformation and the Enlightenment and rationalism we pretty much lost our unique access point. The reason we have nothing to fear, and you undoubtedly know this from Buddhism, is Buddhism doesn't fight about metaphysics like we do, about the nature of God, the shape of God, like I talked about tonight. They try to put all their energy on changing the seer, <laughs> not telling you what to see. What we mostly did in all of our Christian denominations was told you, this is what you should see. <laughs> Mary is immaculately conceived. You know? Jesus was born of a virgin. Uh, and those are just of no interest to much of the world anymore. Huh? Uh, 
be, because they didn't change the seer. I am the book I just finished on the Christ. I have a, a chapter entitled "Our Friends the Buddhist." While we were fighting about metaphysics, most of our history, what the Buddhists did, and this is forever to their credit, is spent centuries of meticulous observation of how the human mind works. All right, and there's just no denying it; they're brilliant at it. <laughs> There's nothing to fight. Just try their practices, and you'll see they're, well, I don't need to tell you. They're true. <laughs> it's obvious. Read uh, Thich Nhat Hanh or Pema Chodron, and just say, try this little practice. It's not going to deny your belief in Jesus or anything like that, but it's going to refine how you see. And, and very often uh, can lead to profound compassion once you change this. Not telling people what to see, but teaching people how to see. So we would like to think, it's probably arrogant of us, but that we got the best of both worlds. That we haven't rejected our Christian tradition, but I as a Franciscan was given access to the whole thing. Most Catholics in the parish church on the corner in New Jersey don't necessarily get big Catholicism. They get parochial Catholicism. And that's okay, but it grows old after a while because it doesn't feed the soul. It's not big enough, do you understand? So for many people, this is why they are so fascinated by Buddhism. Because it asks something of you, instead of you wasting any more time asking something of other people. You grow up, you change your way of seeing, and who of us can't admit that we, that we need that? I certainly know I do. But. Thank you, and I, I pray that you can fill in the gaps for whatever I said poorly. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Don't forget your hat. Oh, I won't do that. Right. Friends, I just want to ask if you would um, summon your prayerful energy. This is an opportunity, I know so many of you have been praying for, for Richard from afar. This is an opportunity for us to pray for him in our, in our midst. And so, Father Richard, I'm gonna invite you to just come down here to the center of this aisle. And I'm going to invite us into an eyes open prayer that we can just focus our, our loving gaze on Father Richard. And I invite you to look back at the eyes of love that have loved you from afar for so many years and who wish you nothing but goodness. Gracious and loving God, we give thanks for Richard. We ask your blessing to continue to be upon him. Continue to use him with the flow of your love to transform the church and to transform the world. God, we give thanks. We ask your blessing on your servant Richard. And the people of God said, Amen. Thank you all for coming.